skin is going to be marked by these arachnoid granulations, which are other blood vessels. And it's going to take the cerebrospinal fluid and essentially drain it. Okay? And it'll take waste away from the brain. Okay? There is a membrane, and I, again, you can't really see it here. I probably should have told you guys, go grab a break right now before I continue. Go ahead and grab a break so you can see these. So grab a head and make sure that they have brains inside of them. <laughs> <laughs> kind of important. <laughs> Again, okay, that one specifically because that needs to go back in the new model. I know, I'm gonna just start there. Okay, all right. So now that you're looking, so if you take the brains out of your heads, not your head specifically, but your model heads, okay, there is a membrane number 46 here. It's called the false cerebri, and what that does is it separates the left and the right hemispheres from one another. Okay, the left and right cerebral hemispheres, I should say. Now, don't confuse that with another structure that you're going to learn about in chapter 16 called the, the false cerebelli. Now, that is going to separate the two hemispheres of your cerebellum. Okay, so false cerebri separates the cerebral hemispheres, false cerebelli. Uh, will separate the cerebellar hemispheres, which is the bottom portion of your brain, okay? And then you have the septum pellucidum, which is another membrane that is going to run down the midline of your cerebro, and it essentially separates the left and right lateral ventricles, which are the largest ventricles that you have in your brain. If you don't know what ventricles are, ventricles, again, are a place where cerebral spinal fluid is going to be made. Okay, so those are the largest ones there. I'll do you another solid. And for those of you guys who came in late, I moved your lab practical to June 8th. So it's not this coming Wednesday anymore. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So here's a slide to help you guys um, kind of test yourselves out. Okay. Again, kind of the same view here, except now we're pointing something else out to you. Okay. This is your pituitary gland, okay? Now the pituitary gland is basically an extension, okay? It's gonna, it's like a little bud that hangs off of your hypothalamus, which isn't very visible here, okay? But the pituitary gland is an endocrine gland. And your pituitary gland actually has two parts to it. There's an anterior portion, and then there's a posterior portion. So the anterior portion is also known as the okay. So the anterior pituitary is also 
also known as the adenohypothesis. In the posterior portion is known as your neurohypothesis. So there's something weird <laughs> that the pituitary gland does, and I'm this portion shows up in chapter 16 for you guys, but the, the main, I guess, chapter that it shows up in is the very last chapter we're going to cover this semester, which I believe is chapter 19, the endocrine system, okay? So this, this pituitary gland, again, separated into two parts, but these two parts function differently from one another. The first portion, the, the anterior portion, the adenohypothesis, actually makes hormones, okay? It makes a number of hormones. And we're going to call these guys tropic hormones, meaning that the anterior pituitary releases hormones that will control other endocrine glands. Okay? They'll control other endocrine glands, basically tell the other endocrine glands when they're supposed to make their hormones. Okay? So you've actually learned of one of these tropic hormones already in the reproductive chapter. Do you guys remember GnRH? Okay, so that actually comes from this guy here, and it helps stimulate the release of FSH, okay? Then the back portion, the posterior pituitary, or the neurohypothesis, it's actually called the neurohypothesis because the, the posterior portion is not made up of endocrine tissue. Rather, it is made up of nervous tissue. So that's a pretty big difference between the two parts of the pituitary. So the anterior portion is completely endocrine. It makes products. The posterior portion is nervous tissue, but it still releases hormones. However, the hormones that the posterior pituitary releases is made in the hypothalamus. So it's kind of like the relationship between the liver and the gallbladder. Do you guys remember how the liver makes bile? Okay. But where is the bile going to be stored and concentrated? In the gallbladder. So it's the same relationship between the posterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus makes hormones like ADH. Okay, ever heard of that one? Okay, ADH. And ADH is then going to be sent over to the posterior pituitary for storage and concentration. And then when the conditions are right, the hypothalamus tells the posterior pituitary to release them. Make sense to everybody here? Any questions on this slide here? All good? Okay, so there's another kind of um, testing slide for you here. There's another one. So now I want you guys to look at your brains here, okay? And mind you, at the ends of your worksheets, there, there is a list of structures that I definitely want you to know, okay? But basically from this view, I want you to see how you're essentially looking at the two largest parts of the mammalian brain, okay? So the largest portion of the brain is this structure right here, this round structure, big round structure. This is called your cerebrum, okay, the cerebrum. And most of your higher level thinking functions, higher order functions, are gonna be controlled by the cerebrum, okay? This bottom part here that looks a little bit wonky, okay, this is called the cerebellum, cerebellum. Now the cerebellum, and I'm, I'm gonna point this out again to you all in lecture, the cerebellum's actually really cool because even though it is fairly small relative to the cerebrum, the cerebellum is so highly folded that it actually contains as many neurons, not more neurons, than the rest of your brain structures combined. Okay. So this has a very high density of neurons associated with it, so much that it actually contains more neurons than the rest of your brain combined. Okay. And um, the cerebellum is primarily responsible for coordinating movements. So if you're able to move fairly smoothly, it's because the cerebellum is controlling all of the signals that go to the rest of your limbs, specifically your, um, 
your voluntary movements and makes them smooth. It, it, it's really, really important in coordination. Now here's the thing. Anybody in here ever gotten drunk? True. Last night. I'm sorry. Last night? How are you Okay. Are you 21? Yeah. <laughs> are you 21? I'm 22. Oh, okay. Aww. All right. Okay, I just needed to make sure. Needed to make sure here. Not that I give you crap about it, but, you know. Okay, when you're drunk, how do you walk? Hero, you want to demonstrate? <laughs> like this? <laughs> like that, that's how you walk? Okay, so I don't know if you noticed, but when you're drunk, your body coordination is not very good. This is part of the reason why they do that whole walk a line test um, when you get pulled over by a cop. Don't drink and drive, kids. Okay. <laughs> so the reason for that is because alcohol can actually cross your blood-brain barrier. Excuse me, I have really bad allergies right now. We had a really bad post-nasal drug. Okay. Um, you're gross. But anyway, alcohol crosses the blood-brain barrier and it essentially goes directly to your cerebellum. For this particular reason, if you injure your cerebellum, so let's say you fell backwards and injured this part, your movements essentially mimic those of a person who was drunk. Okay? So your coordinations are a little bit off. Okay? So that's that part of the reason why. People who have cerebellar injuries um, have issues with coordination. All right, this one has a lot. So take pictures if you need to right now instead of going crazy writing. I'm sorry, you guys. I really should probably should have written that in like orange so you can see it a little bit better. I like it. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this structure called the corpus callosum, and while I'm doing this, I'm expecting you guys to look at your brains, okay? Because you can actually take these things apart, all right? Uh, there's also something here that was not in your notes right here, so I'm gonna want you to add it when I get to it, okay? So this big portion right here, and I want you guys to notice how this is not a membrane. This is vastly different from, can I borrow your, can I borrow your head? Okay, I want you guys to notice that this is vastly different. Notice how you have these membranes right here, okay? So these are membranes covering your cerebrum. But you also have the actual brain portion, the cerebrum part, but there's also this large kind of area here. This is not a membrane, okay? So number 138 is what's known as your corpus callosum, the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum allows the left and right sides of your cerebrum to communicate with one another, okay? Now, if you have something like seizures, epilepsy, okay, one of the ways that they surgically treat it is they actually cut that corpus callosum to prevent the left and right sides from communicating with one another and basically stop the misfiring from going through. Isn't that kind of nuts? I do. Yeah. Oh, but it's brain surgery, so it's not like something that they commonly or easily go. No, they don't do that all the time. <laughs> okay. This little pink portion, so I'm going to give this back to you guys here. This little pink portion right here, this is called the pineal gland, and it's actually part of the epithalamus. Now, the thalamus, epithalamus, and hypothalamus comprise a portion of your brain called the diencephalon. Okay, the diencephalon. So this pineal gland is actually a portion of the epithalamus. And what does epi mean? On top of. So here's what I want you guys to remember, okay? The thalamus is in the middle, the epithalamus is on top of it, the hypothalamus is in the bottom of it. So there's a relationship going on here. This pineal gland's claim to fame is that it secretes a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is what helps you sleep. It's what helps you regulate your sleep-wake cycle. So if you're like me and there's no rest for the wicked, right, and you don't sleep, okay, People will typically say like, hey, you should take some melatonin supplements and you can just actually go to the store and then Liz, Liz is like, no, no, okay, huh? 
Yeah, it doesn't work, right? Okay, so you can take melatonin, or supposedly you can take melatonin, but they need to make sure that you, that you give yourselves eight to 10 hours from the time that you take it to ensure that you get your sleep there, okay? There's a little portion here, 170, they're calling it the third ventricle here, okay? And the third ventricle, again, a structure that makes cerebrospinal fluid, and then that's gonna drain into a structure known as the cerebral aqueduct, okay? So what ends up happening, you guys, is, and, and when we get to the ventricle slide in here, I'll talk about the relationships. You have two really large lateral ventricles that kind of look like horns on each of your cerebrum. They'll make cerebrospinal fluid. That cerebrospinal fluid is gonna drain into the third ventricle. The third ventricle is then gonna drain its cerebrospinal fluid to the fourth ventricle, which is not shown here. It's gonna be somewhere down here. And it's gonna pass through the cerebral aqueduct before it gets to the fourth ventricle. So there's basically a cerebral spinal fluid, a CSF super highway in your brain and in your spinal cord, okay? And your starting places would be your ventricles from there, okay? There's an interventricular foramen. <laughs> what does foramen mean? It's a hole. So the interventricular foramen allows your lateral ventricles to dump their um, cerebral spinal fluid down into the third ventricle, okay? Now I'm gonna give you guys a heads up. In your later slides, there is a structure called the mesencephalic aqueduct. It's basically the cerebral aqueduct. It's just a different name for it. Everybody here good on that? Yes? Okay, all right. Then you have the thalamus. We talked about the epithalamus via the pineal gland already. Then we have the thalamus. The thalamus is an incredibly important relay center for sensory information, okay? So super duper important there. And then when you look at your brain, can I borrow your brain? So this thing comes out, and you're gonna notice that later, this thing will come out by itself. You'll have one of the slides. You have a couple of bulges on the slides here. So you have 159 and 160, which are the bottom ones, okay? So when you look at them. So the one at the top is called the superior colliculus. The one in the bottom is called the inferior colliculus. Together, these are called your colliculi. Colliculi is plural. So the superior one is really important for visual information processing. The inferior one is important for auditory processing. Okay. Now these structures are part of your brain called the mesencephalon. So mes means middle, okay? It's called the mesencephalon here. So it's the mid, um, it's part of your midbrain, okay? <clears throat> now, when you get to the bottom portion of that stalk that you can pull out, okay, you have the pons, which again is a really important relay center, and then you have the medulla oblongata. So the pons, along with your cerebellum, where did your cerebellum go? It's back there. So the pons and your cerebellum together make up a portion of your brain called the metencephalon. The medulla oblongata, which is this lower bulge down here, 167, okay, so the pons is this big bulge, okay, 165. The medulla oblongata is essentially the top of your spinal cord, okay? It's the bottom of your brain, but also the top of your spinal cord. And it's gonna be known as your myelencephalon. Both of these structures together, the metencephalon and the myelencephalon, combine to form a portion of your brain called the rhombencephalon or the hindbrain, okay? Hindbrain. So I'm gonna write something on the board right quick here because you guys are all looking at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> now I am not nuts. Can you all see my board? Is it too dark or is it okay? I'm 
Am I nuts or am I hearing something kind of vibrate? What is that noise? No, no it's, it's inside it's, the room. It's a, it's a hum. You know I'm allergic to alcohol, right? <laughs> There's other ways to get drunk. <laughs> drunk on love. There you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys are funny. So during development, okay, during development, your brain essentially starts out as a hollow tube and the hollow tube has a hole in it called the neuro seal. Eventually, as you undergo development, your brain starts to fold upon itself and it's going to form three distinct regions. So we're going to have a region called the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. So the forebrain is also known as your, let's see if this works here, prosencephalon, okay? And I want you guys to break this word apart with me. What does encephal mean? It's brain. Encephal means brain. What does prose mean or pro? Like what's a prologue? comes before. So this, the prosencephalon, is your forebrain, okay? The midbrain is known as your mesencephalon. And then the hindbrain is called your rhombencephalon. Okay, so these are the first divisions of your brain. A few more weeks pass and your brain actually further subdivides, okay? So the prosencephalon is going to divide into the diencephalon and your telencephalon. Okay. So the telencephalon, that's the fancy pants name for your cerebrum, the diencephalon, this is basically your epithalamus, your thalamus, and what's the last part here? Epithalamus and hypothalamus. Okay, so these are your diencephalons. Okay. The mesencephalon does not divide anymore. It remains as is. But the rhombencephalon also divides. So your rhombencephalon is going to divide into the metencephalon and the mylencephalon. Everybody here clear on that so far? Yes? Okay. The myelencephalon is essentially your medulla oblongata. And the metencephalon is going to be comprised of the pons and the cerebellum together. So this is how your brain develops when you're in utero. Okay. Should you know this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. You should know this, if not for a lab, then also specifically for a lecture. 
Okay, you're definitely going to need to know this division in lecture. Hold on, my hair. Oh, she yeah. came out on mine. <laughs> oh, well, you two videos. Yes, they're going to combine all of them together. <laughs> End of the year. <laughs> <laughs> all right, can I go ahead and pop my uh, projector screen down, you guys? Okay. I talked about the pawns being 
an important relay center, but I think I neglected to mention where it's relaying the information to. So your pond, which is this big bulge right in front of 166, okay, that's a relay center to the cerebellum. The medulla oblongata, which again is essentially the top of the spinal cord, that's another relay center, but it's a relay center to the pons. What was the first one? The relay center to? The pons, mm -hmm. which is that big bulge right here, it's a relay center to the, um, did I say medulla oblongata? No, the, it's a relay center to the cerebellum. And then the medulla oblongata, which is down here, it's the top of the spinal cord, it's a relay center to the pons. So relay center to the pons and the thalamus. Your medulla oblongata also controls a number of things. And if you've ever watched The Water Boy, mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's his thing Ma about the medulla? medulla. Ob the medulla oblongata like it's damaged, so he's got like anger issues. Yes and no. It's yeah. part of the system called the limbic system in your brain, which is your emotional brain. But your medulla oblongata also helps really? relay information to the thalamus, to the pons, etc but it also controls basic functions like your heart rate and your breathing, okay? You've actually learned about two really important respiratory centers in the pons and in the medulla oblongata. Do you guys remember that from like chapter 16? So remember your medulla contains the respiratory centers that control rhythmicity, so it's the basic rhythm of your breathing, how fast or how slow it is. And then your pontine centers control inspiration, deep inspiration and the limits of deep inspiration. You guys remember that? Pneumotaxic center versus apneustic center in the pons, so that they're there, okay? Here's the blank version. There's the other one here. Okay, so at this point we have seen the lateral, we haven't seen the lateral ventricles yet, but we've seen the third ventricle, we've seen the interventricular foramen, we've seen the cerebral aqueduct. Now we're gonna look at the four the same ventricle here. Right here. Hey, hey Hussein. He's not here, right? 
There's this large space. This is actually your lateral ventricle. This is your lateral ventricle. And then there's a space that kind of runs towards the back. Okay. It's where your third ventricle is. And then do you guys see how there's this large space down here where I'm kind of sticking my fingers through it's in the bottom? It's right by the cerebellum. That's your fourth ventricle. So these brains are great because they're big, but a lot of the structures are not labeled here, but it's actually really nice to see where the ventricles are located. Okay, so that's, and I, again, I want you to realize that the ventricles are spaces. Okay, so that's what's being shown to you on this slide. Alright, so remember I told you that there's going to be a slide with ventricles right here? So they're showing them to you here. They are not structures like this, they are spaces. So that's why I wanted you to look at this big old brain right here and understand that they are actually structures right there. Okay, so the lateral ventricles look like horns. They're large spaces. In the, um, in the cerebrum, and we just tend to call them lateral ventricles. And I know at this point a lot of people should be asking, hey, we have a third ventricle and we have a fourth ventricle. Where are the first and the second? One and two. And these are your first and your second lateral ventricles. And then you remember earlier there was a space called the interventricular foramen, which are holes. So what happens is you have the choroid plexus, it makes cerebrospinal fluid. The ventricles also make cerebrospinal fluid. They're also aligned with epidemal cells. So they'll make their cerebrospinal fluid, and both the lateral ventricles will drain their cerebrospinal fluid via the interventricular foramen onto the third ventricle, which is right smack in the very middle of your brain. Okay, it's a small space there. The third ventricle adds its cerebrospinal fluid to the ones that it got from the lateral ventricles. And then it's gonna then drain out into the fourth ventricle <coughs> via a structure called the cerebral or mesencephalic aqueduct, which is this guy here, okay? So I want you to notice that there's actually a row that the CSF flows through. It's gonna go lateral ventricles, interventricular foramen, down into the um, third ventricle. Third ventricle, it's going to go down through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. Everybody here clear on that? Okay. Now I want you guys to notice that this fourth ventricle, and this is not in your labs, this is actually in from, the information I'm giving you right now is from your lecture. I want you to notice how that fourth ventricle has two things that jut off of it onto the side. Does everybody see that? Okay, that's pretty important for us because cerebral spinal fluid as it flows down, some of it will go sideways and it'll go back around the brain. The rest of it is gonna come down and into the central canal of your spinal cord. So if you recall on Monday, we looked at the cross section of the spinal cord and there was this tiny little hole in the middle. That tiny little hole in the middle is where cerebrospinal fluid is gonna flow through. Everybody here clear? So as the, um, as the fourth ventricle, um, the cerebrospinal fluid goes back, surrounds the brain, eventually it's gonna find its way over to that superior sagittal sinus, okay? And it's gonna be reabsorbed by the body to take waste away that were generated by the brain. Any questions on this? Yes or no? Here's, the, here's what I'm gonna tell you. For the ventricles, I'm not going to expect you to know them on the models. I'll expect you to know them on the slides. Just because I know that it's really difficult to see them in the models themselves. Like the main models that we're using, which is that head with that little brain. Okay, you can't even really see the ventricles there. So that's why I pulled out the big brains for you. But because the big brains are not a part of your... Um, of your worksheet, I'm not going to test you on it using a model. Oh shoot, there was something I forgot. Okay, need you guys to go to this slide right here. So we 
back a few. What's this structure called? Cerebellum. This is the cerebellum. So everybody, I want you to look at your cerebellum. You can pull it out like this. Okay. So notice how. Um, notice how it's very highly folded compared to the cerebrum. The cerebrum has folds. But the folds of the cerebellum are much smaller and it's a lot more numerous. So again, that's the reason why it's gonna have a lot more neurons. But if you flip the cerebellum over, and if you were to dissect it down the middle, do you guys see how there's this structure here that's white? Does everybody here see that? What does it look like to you? Something more commonplace. What does it look like? It looks like a tree. A lot of you guys said tree, right? Kind of looks like a tree, probably, right? So the, I'm looking at the whole thing here. So this structure, and I want everybody to know this. Now, this is not in your lab slides, but you may or may not be responsible for knowing this. So is this white matter or gray matter? White. This is white matter. So the white matter of your cerebellum is called the arbor vitae, okay? So the Arbor Vitae is the white matter of your cerebellum. Okay, it's the white matter of your cerebellum. It's called the Arbor Vitae because what, what does Arbor mean? Um, Tree. What does Vitae mean or Vitae? Okay, like vitality, what does vitality mean or vital? Life. So arbor vitae actually means tree of life, because it looks like this, okay? So again, the white matter of your cerebellum is called the arbor vitae, arbor vitae, is how people will say it, okay? But that's your tree of life here. And it's white matter, so what is that comprised of? Myelinated axons. Myelinated axons, it's a bunch of myelinated axons. What about the gray matter, what's that comprised of? Unmyelinated axons and? Cell bodies. <laughs> Cell bodies and what? Dendrites. Dendrites. Oh. True or false? Dendrites can be myelinated. Raise your hands if you say true. Raise your hands if you say false. Here's like. <laughs> it's false. Okay, the only things that are myelinated are going to be axons. Okay, all right, moving forward here. Here's the ventricle slide with no labels. Okay, should you know this? Yes. What's another name for mesencephalic aqueduct? The easier one. Cerebral. Cerebral aqueduct. Why do you think it's called mesencephalic aqueduct though? Where is it running through? So it runs through the mesencephalon, which is your midbrain. Okay, here's the lateral view. Should you know this one? Yeah. Yes. Okay, again, same deal. Here's the lateral ventricle. Here's the third ventricle here. Okay, notice how the third ventricle is actually pretty big when you're looking at it from a side view. Okay, here's that cerebral aqueduct, and then here's that fourth ventricle here, and here's that spinal canal. horizontal plane, okay? So you're gonna have an anterior portion and you're gonna have a 
um, not an anterior, a superior portion and an inferior portion. And we're looking at the inferior portion right now, looking at it from the top down. That's what you're looking at here. So don't get confused, okay? So your basal nuclei is going to be comprised of two main structures. It's called the corpus striatum and the plostrum, okay? And the plostrum. This corpus striatum is a major input site for structures called the basal ganglia. So I want you guys to make the connection here, okay? In the brain, you have a basal, you have basal nuclei. What are nuclei again? Clusters of cell bodies where? In the CNS, in the brain or the spinal cord, right? What are ganglia? Same deal, clusters of cell bodies, but now they're in the PNS, right? Now they're in the PNS. They're in structures radiating off of the central nervous system, off of the spinal cord, typically, okay? So the corpus striatum is basically where the majority of information going to your basal ganglia is gonna come from. Everybody here clear? Yes? Yes. Okay. The clostrum, okay, is going to be really important for the processing, the subconscious processing of visual information. Okay, it's going to be important for the visual processing, uh, sorry, the subconscious processing of visual information. Okay. This corpus striatum is going to be divided into two parts, and this is the part where it gets a little bit complicated because notice how many subdivisions there are, correct? So the corpus striatum is going to be comprised of the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus. So the caudate nucleus we've already talked about. Remember, this is what's going to control large automatic movements of your skeletal muscles. Everybody good? Yes? This lentiform nucleus down here, notice how it can be separated. It's going to be um, divided into the globus pallidus and the putamen. The globus pallidus controls muscle tone. If you don't know what muscle tone refers to, muscle tone refers to tiny contractions that basically keep your muscles in shape. Okay, so that they're not falling apart. Okay, they're tiny little contractions that will help keep the muscles in shape. Okay. The putamen, okay, essentially has the same function as the caudate nucleus. So it's gonna help control those large automatic movements. Everybody here clear? Yes? All good? Okay. Thalamus, we've already talked about before, but if you need to rehear it from me, the thalamus is a relay center um, to the cerebrum and it's gonna process sensory information. Okay. So if I'm touching the table that sends a message to the thalamus, the thalamus goes, oh, okay, I need to send that information to a pathway in the cerebrum so that the cerebrum can interpret it as touch. The reason why I'm pointing that out is because all of your senses, all of the information from your sensory neurons is gonna be transmitted to the brain in the same form, meaning they're gonna be transmitted in the form of action potentials, okay? Action potentials are action potentials. They're essentially just electrical signals. The way that the brain interprets the action potentials as different senses is gonna be dependent on the pathway that those action potentials take to the brain, okay? If it goes one way, it's gonna be interpreted as touch. If it goes another pathway, it's gonna be interpreted as sight. Another one, it's gonna be interpreted as smell. So then, sorry, what? Yes, okay, so it is intro to physio. Have you guys ever heard of a condition called synesthesia? Okay, have you guys heard of people Tasting, uh, tasting sounds or um, hearing colors. Yeah? Okay. For those of you who are going to take me in physio sometime, I will show you a video on this. So there is, it's not even necessarily a disorder. It's basically the way that information travels to the brain 
it takes multiple pathways instead of the typical one that you know normal people have. So that's why they're able to associate things like different senses with each other. So like I said, hearing colors, right? Or tasting names. Like Roger can taste like bacon, okay? Or, I don't know, George can, can taste like a sock, like a smelly sock, okay? But here's the thing about people who are synesthetes. People who are synesthetes actually tend to have really good memories because they're able to form more connections so they're able to understand it better. But here's the thing, everybody is actually a synesthete to some degree. When you guys watch a movie, okay, when you guys watch a movie, you're hearing sounds coming from where? Speakers, right? But your brain at the same time is watching a picture and there's a person that's moving their mouth but your brain interprets it as the sound coming from that person's mouth when it's really coming from the speakers. So that's actually a low level of synesthesia there that you're displaying. Everybody can be synesthetes to a high degree. It's just a matter of whether you're practicing it or not. But some people are naturally born with the ability to connect their senses and control it much better than others. But those people also tend to have really great memories. So it's actually really cool. Any questions on that? No? Okay. I can talk to you guys about that in physio. I'm kind of excited. There's a whole bunch of like brain disorders for that. Kind of. <laughs> all right. So next up here, we have all of these different parts, okay? You guys have seen all of these before, except for this thing called the insula. So whenever you hear the word insula or insular, it actually refers to something relating to an island, an island. So on normal circumstances, when we're talking about the cerebrum, you're gonna talk about all of these different lobes, right? You'll talk about the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, occipital lobe, so on and so forth. But there's actually a fifth lobe that a lot of people don't tend to talk about, and it's called the insula. So the insula is an island of cortex that is deep inside the brain. Now, if you remember in the spinal cord, the cortex portion, the cortical portion of the spinal cord is comprised of what kind of matter, white or gray? It's white matter. And then remember the horns in the middle? the A-shaped structure, that's gray matter. In your cerebrum, in your brain, the opposite is true, okay? The cortical portion is gray matter, the middle portion is white matter. However, looking at the way that the brain is folded, I want you to notice that there's a portion of the brain that goes in pretty deep right here, okay? And this is what's called your insula, because I want you to notice that the insula right here is basically going to be surrounded by white matter. So you'd normally expect this to be white matter, except instead it's cortical matter. It's gray cortical matter. Okay, so that's why you call it the insula. That's the only thing I want you guys to know from this slide. And the other parts of the will be labeled. Uh, Alright. Gonna do you a solid, okay? You don't need to know this slide, but should you know the parts of this slide for lecture? Oh, yes. Okay. For your lab practical, you don't need to know this. But it doesn't mean don't study it because it gave you a lot of information today, right? Yeah? Okay. You're not gonna need to know this slide either but I want you to know what the insula is. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Should you know this one though? Yeah. Yeah, because this one already showed up in your lectures, correct? Yes? So you should know this one. We've talked about these parts already in the lecture on Monday. So again, Notice how it's flipped for the spinal cord. The middle is gray matter. These are called your horns. The outside.
inside is white matter. And remember, every single nerve in your spinal cord is going to have a, um, a posterior or a dorsal root. Okay, it's going to have a dorsal ganglion, and then there's going to be an anterior root, an anterior or a ventral root. Okay, and then here's the actual nerve. So your nerves actually, when they connect to the spinal cord, they're going to split up. There's going to be a connection in the front, and there's going to be a connection in the back. Everybody here clear on that so far? Yes? Connection in the front, connection in the back. The connection in the back has a bulge called the spinal ganglion, and what does a ganglion contain, everybody? Cell? Bodies. Everybody good on that? Okay. Your spinal cord can be divided into left and right sides. Okay. So here's the left side. Sorry, here's the right side. Here's the left side. Okay. And you're, it's going to be divided by two structures, one in the front, one in the back. So in the back, you have the posterior median sulcus. And in the front, you actually have an anterior median fissure, which is larger than the sulcus. Everyone good? Yes? Okay. Here's that central canal. What flows through the central canal, everybody? Cerebrospinal fluid. You can call it CSF. Okay, CSF. And then notice how you have these kind of lines on either side of the central, uh, the central canal. You have these lines of gray matter. These are called your gray commissures. Because again, a commissure is a connection. This is what allows the left and the right side of your spinal cord to communicate with one another. Any questions on this? All good? Okay, I have a few more slides here. Okay, so that one's okay. Oh, she forgot to talk about horns. Forgot to talk about that. So for your horns, Okay, this H-shaped or butterfly-like structure, it's gonna have three parts to it. There's a posterior horn, an anterior horn, and the lateral horn right here, okay? Lateral horn right here, okay? So the posterior horn, really important for sensory information, okay? So it's gonna uh, contain sensory somatic and visceral nuclei. The anterior horn, this is somatic motor, okay? Your lateral horn is important for um, visceral motor. Visceral motor. Visceral. It's like one of those things that they have at like temples. Mm -hmm. This one is a beast, so if you're not recording me, record me right now. I'm going to do you a solid on here. You don't have to know this for the lab practical, but you definitely need to know this for your exam, your unit exam, okay? What do you call bundles of axons in the peripheral nervous system? Nerves, okay? What do you call them in the central nervous system? Those are cell bodies. It's up there. It's up here, the teacher. Tracks. Tracks, okay? So what you're looking at here are tracks, okay? You're looking at tracks right here, okay? So you're going to have tracks. And the tracks, remember, are essentially bundles of axons that are running down your spinal cord. You're going to have two groups of tracks for me. I'm not going to write this down because this is so much to write. So I want you guys to pay really close attention. Take your videos if you need to. So you're going to have two sets of tracks for me. There's going to be the somatosensory tract, and then there's going to be the motor tract. The somatosensory tract is so-called because what it's going to do 
is it's going to send information from the spinal cord to the brain. Okay? So somatosensory kind of lets you know that it's going to be sending sensory information. So it's going to take information from your senses, from your external and internal environments, and then it's going to send it to the brain for processing. Okay? So these are also known as your ascending tracts because it, the um, transmission of information is from bottom up, spinal cord to the brain. Everybody here following me so far still? Thumbs up, thumbs down for me. Okay. Don't go insane here. Do not go insane here just yet. Don't go insane just yet. Okay. I'll tell you what these things mean in a second. If you have some added sensory tract that send messages from the spinal cord to the brain, you should also have descending tracts that send messages from the brain to the spinal cord and then outwards, correct? So those are called your motor tracts. Everybody here following me? Those are called your motor tracts. Everybody good? All right. Do you guys see how there are three things in purple right here? Okay. So the three that are in purple, these are your motor tracts. The three that are in purple are your motor tracts. So is that ascending or descending? This is descending, meaning it's going to send messages from the brain to the spinal cord and outwards to produce movement, right? Okay. So you have three... Um, motor tracts here, you have the lateral cortical spinal, okay, you have the bulbo reticulospinal and the rubrospinal tract here. There's actually another one, um, which they're not showing you here, which is the anterior cortical spinal. It's not showing, oh, yeah, sorry, it's right there. Sorry, there are four. The anterior cortical spinal tract right here, okay. So anywhere that you see purple, these are descending tracks, they're motor, okay? And notice how there's a P and an EP above them, okay? That's because your motor tracks can be divided into two groups, depending on where they're located. P stands for pyramidal, okay? Like a pyramid, okay? okay it stands for pyramidal, okay? EP stands for extra pyramidal meaning it's outside of the pyramid. There's a structure that you're gonna learn about in your lecture called the pyramids, okay? It's gonna be associated with a particular portion of your brain that I'm not gonna tell you about right now because I want you to find out what it is and then come back to me next Wednesday and, and figure out <laughs> what that is or tell me in lecture today, okay? All right. But I'm going to start off here, okay, so the lateral cortical spinal, okay, this is going to send messages over to your skeletal muscles, okay? And before I continue on with that, anywhere that you see P, the pyramidal ones, the, remember you're sending messages from the brain to where? To the spinal cord and outwards, okay? So all of the pyramidal tracts, the messages are gonna originate from the cerebral cortex. You should write that down. All of your pyramidal tracts, okay, the messages are gonna originate from the cerebral cortex, and it's always going to control precise voluntary movement. Precise voluntary movement. Which now kind of gives you an idea that if the pyramidal tracts control precise voluntary movement, what do you think the extra pyramidal tracts will control? Involuntary. Involuntary movement. Great. Okay. So remember the pyramidal tracts originate from the cerebral cortex. It's going to control voluntary movement. The extra pyramidal tracts will originate in the brain stem. It's going to originate in the brainstem. So the brainstem is going to refer to essentially your pons and your medulla oblongata. So the messages are going to originate from there, and it's going to control involuntary movement. Okay? So now I'm going to talk about the subdivisions here. So the lateral cortical spinal, that's going to control your skeletal muscles. Okay? Where do the messages from P come from? Pardon? 
cerebral cortex, the outer portion of your brain. Okay. The um, anterior corticospinal, this also controls skeletal muscles. Moving on to the extrapyramidal ones, the bulboreticulospinal is going to control things like posture, okay? Preparatory and movement related activities, okay? That's what the bulboreticulospinal is going to control. Is this all in your study? Like lecture? Yes. Okay. All of this is in lecture. I'm just saying it out loud so that when you guys watch your videos, because this is from chapter 15, okay? So this was technically last week's lecture. You kind of have an idea what you're getting yourselves into already, because I know it's a lot of information. The rubrospinal tract is basically gonna send information to all of your flexors and extensors. What do flexors do? Flex. Well, yeah, what does flexing mean? Decreasing. Decreasing the angle, and what does extension mean? increasing the angle. So that rubrospinal tract is what's gonna send messages to those. Everybody good on those? Yes? Okay, are you guys ready for the ascending tracts now? Okay, so remember the ascending tracts, these are the ones that are in red, okay? All right, so the posterior column is gonna be comprised of these two parts. You have the cuneate fascicle, and then you have the gracile fascicle. You can call it fasciculus cuneatus or fasciculus gracilis. Either one is fine, okay? But these two essentially control things like proprioception, okay? Proprioception refers to body positioning, okay? Two-point discrimination, which has something to do with fine touch, and vibrations. So that's what the posterior column controls. Body positioning, two-point discrimination or fine touch, and vibrations. Thumbs up, thumbs down if you're following me there still. All good, okay. The posterior and anterior uh, spinocerebellar tracts, these will control uh, proprioception, so again, body positioning, okay. Then you have two STTs here, okay? So when I say STTs, I'm referring to spinothalamic tract. If you hear me say SCT, that refers to spinal cerebellar tract. The two spinothalamic tracts, okay, they'll control things like pain, temperature sensations, crude touch, and deep pressure. So they're basically detecting the opposite of your posterior column. So if your posterior column is more so for like fine touch, two point discrimination, light vibrations, your spinothalamic tract, both the lateral and the anterior is gonna be concerned with deeper pressure, okay? Pain, crude touch, okay? So not very light at all. If somebody punches you in the face, you're gonna interpret that as a punch because messages have been sent through those spinal thalamic tracts. Everybody here clear on that? Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit more information to tell you specifically what they're referring to. Okay. <clears throat> the lateral STT is for pain and temperature. The anterior STT is for crude touch and pressure. Okay, this is for touch and pressure. Okay, this is for pain and temperature. Any questions here? Are your brains about to explode, truth? Yeah, okay, so because of that, I'm not gonna test you on this on your lab practical. I wanna give you more time to learn these for what? Exam. Your exam. Why am I giving you guys more time to learn this for your exam? Because for a lot of you, exam number three is gonna be pretty high stakes, right? Why? Because you'll replace our first exam with that one. Yeah, because I'm going to do a grade replacement using your third exam. So if your third exam grade is higher than either one of your two first exams, I will double that grade up for you. Meaning it'll count twice. Does that make sense to everybody here? Yes? 
So theoretically, you could have gotten a zero on either exam one or exam two and still be able to <laughs> technically have a chance at passing, right, if you do really, really well on exam number three, because I'll replace your grade there. Make sense to everybody here? By the way, you guys are my guinea pig class when it comes to that. I've never done that before. Never, ever. All right, last few slides here. Sheep brain, do you guys want to dissect brains today or you guys just want to look at them? Because we do have some that are already cut, so if you want to look at them. No one wants to look at these. Okay. I know. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I'm going to test you on the sheep brain. I'm not going to test you on the sheep brain, but let's look at the structures, okay? Why do we study sheep brains? other than the fact that they're small. They're very, very similar to ours. So a lot of the structures that we have actually show up in sheep also. Okay, so you have the cerebrum right here. You have the cerebellum. What do you call the white structure in the cerebellum here? Arb arbor. arbor. Not arboretum. Arbor. Arbor vitae or arbor vitae, okay? Tree of life. It's basically all of the white matter in there, okay? Um, oh, that's like an awful picture. Okay, they're saying, that, so this is the corpus callosum right here. But there are, again, are spaces here. So notice how it's actually showing you this is where the lateral ventricles are. So here's one and here's two. The third ventricle is here. Fourth ventricle is down here. And then notice how I kind of drew it out because you do have extensions going outwards. And then from there, the cerebrospinal fluid is going to go up and coat the brain. Everybody here good? Yes? Okay. So do you guys remember me talking about the false cerebri? Which they're showing you is number 35 here. Okay, so they, they peeled it back. So there's a membrane that separates it. There's another one, okay, there's another one that separates the um, left and right sides of the cerebellum, that's your false cerebelli, okay, so don't confuse them. Don't confuse false cerebelli with tentorium cerebelli, okay? False always separates right from left sides, but it's within the same structure. So if I say false cerebri, that's gonna separate right and left cerebral hemispheres. If I say false cerebelli, that's gonna separate the left and right cerebellar hemispheres. The tentorium cerebelli will separate, it's basically a, um, which they kind of show you here, it's a membrane that's going to separate the cerebellum from the cerebrum. That's what the tentorium cerebelli are. Okay. Everyone good? Yes? That's actually a really good corpus callosum picture here. Right. Here's that corpus callosum. I want you to notice how it's basically like a little bridge. And what does the corpus callosum do? Allows for communication between communication between the left and the right sides of the brain. Everybody here good on that? Okay. Then you have the septum pellucidum. The septum pellucidum is a thin, thin membrane that's going to separate your lateral ventricles. It's going to separate the left ventricle from the right uh, from the right ventricle there. And that is it for this one. When's your lab practical, everybody? Next Wednesday. Not, not this coming Wednesday. Next Wednesday, June 8th. I hope that's okay. Okay, I want you guys to at least take a breather a little bit and whatnot. Because I can guarantee you if I gave you guys your lab practical this coming Wednesday, a lot of you guys would not do well. Take your pictures. I'm here for questions. Peace. I'm so sad, though. You guys know this is basically going to be our last lab together for anatomy, other than the lab practical. Oh yeah, what do you guys want to do next week? Do you want me to cancel lab? Do you want me to use that as... Um, I Because I was going to open the lab on Monday. 
not 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 next Monday, but the Monday right before your lab practical. So it's up to you guys. Do you want me to cancel lab next Wednesday and take that time to study, or I can come here on Wednesday and essentially use it as lecture time. You know, I can I can do that. Huh? I want to feel like that means like I am. Uh, <laughs> you no. guys decide. I don't want to be home. Like if I get my home, I can't study. And I'm like, can you go clean this? Can you go do the lecture? So next Wednesday, there's no more lab. There is literally no more lab because what what you what the original schedule essentially said was you're supposed to have your lab practical next week, week 